So, herzlich willkommen. Okay, welcome back to the first uh, afternoon session from the political conference Heinrich Böll Stiftung. I welcome everybody here in the room and everybody on screen. My name is Ronja Schöler. I am advisor for safety and security policy in uh, the parliament. And I am delighted to announce the panel with the name Europe Alone Thinking at Fro. And it doesn't say US in the title, but the big question is, of course, what would happen if the United States would clearly turn away from Europe? The safety warranties would um, be wavered, and what would happen if you know, Donald Trump becomes a president of the United States again? Trump 2.0 seems to be a scenario getting more and more probable. He'll probably be the candidate for the Republicans, even uh, <clears throat> some of the institutes seeing him in direct comparison with Joe Biden, about four, five, six, seven. Uh, percentage point in front. So that's a scenario one should prepare for. And on the other side, Europe, by the, again, new uh, <clears throat> uh, aggressive attack of the Russians again uh, against Ukraine, uh, has been startled a bit, but it is far away from a common safety and security policy. We have uh, discussed this at a certain length in the morning, but uh, so currently um, Europe wouldn't be able to fully compensate a dropping out of the US. We've got the NATO developing a new strategic concept, uh, but again here the European pillar hasn't been set up to compensate the US. At the fringe of the EU, we see states, Georgia, Moldavia, that feel more and more threatened by Russia and wonder who would guarantee for their safety. So Europe alone at home is the question that we want to discuss now. And I'm happy to welcome to this discussion three uh, excellent panelists, which I'd like to ask to the stage, Cory Shaki, Natalie Sabanadze, and Anton Hofreiter. Please join me on the stage and take your seats. I'll just briefly present the three. On my right, Cory Shaki, senior fellow and director of uh, foreign international policy studies at the American Enterprise Institute, a conservative think tank, getting her beloved coffee right now. Uh, Curry works on national safety, security, transatlantic relationships, and the international order, and can really look back to an excellent career in politics and research, amongst others, in the US uh, Foreign and Defense Ministry, the Security Council, and also as a um, representative director in London. Welcome, and happy to have you here. And next to her, we have Natalie Sabanatze, Senior Research Fellow in the Russian and Eurasia Program for Chatham House, also a think tank in London, um, works on uh, international politics of Russia and the question of Europe in the world. Last, she was a visiting fellow at the Mount Holyoke College, College and for, from 2013 to 2021, a Georgian ambassador, amongst others, in, at the European Union, but also Belgium, Luxembourg. I'm happy that you're ready to share your perspective here. Welcome to the panel. And then last but least, uh, uh, not an unknown person here, Tony Hofreiter. Uh, chair of the EU committee in the federal parliament, 2013 to 2021, he was the head of the German the fractions in the parliament. He's member in the party since I have been in this world uh, since 86 and 2005. He's in the parliament. 
fact, he's a, pro, uh, he's a PhD in biology, but um, has come forward as a supporter of the Ukraine in the last years. Welcome, and I'm happy, looking forward to the discussion with you. And, and just a few administrative actions. Um, I and Tony will speak German. German. Corey and Natalie will speak English. We have interpretation ongoing, so use the headsets for that. We've got some 90 minutes for the debate. We're going to start here talking on the panel, and then we will open for your questions from the audience. And maybe you have wondered why we have these uh, color cards on your chairs. These are there so that uh, we don't uh, all drop into the graveyard shift after lunch, but I'd like to start by asking you things. The red card is no, the green card is yes, and I'd like to ask the answer the following question, very simple. If the U.S. Uh, drops out as a safety guarantee, can Europe depend on itself? Yes would be green, a red no, and just give me an impression. Well, I just if you look around, we see quite a high number of red cards, but uh, some green ones as well, of people who would trust uh, Europe to be able to take care for itself. We would take this as a kickoff into the debate here on the stage, and I'd like to start with a scenario which I have sketched out already, a second presidency of Donald Trump. Corey, looking at you straight away, just please take us along through a little experimental way of thinking what would it look like for the United States with Donald Trump as a president again and for the international partners, the international order, how would a re-election differentiate, re differentiate from the first presidency? So what will be similar to the first Trump administration is that he actually says what he's going to do and he actually tries to do it. And so you should take quite seriously uh, his uh, belief that, you know, Russia and China are great powers and deserve spheres of influence, that the United States should permit that instead of defending the perimeter of the free world, um, that he thinks America's allies take advantage of us and ought to be doing a lot more for themselves, that he believes in tariffs, not trade, uh, and that he believes that immigration is bad for the United States, when in fact, of course, it's the lifeblood of American economy and American society. Uh, so I think you'll see a lot of similarity. The president has already, our disgraced former president, has already said those things, um, has talked about, uh, you know, uh, if not outright withdrawing from NATO, calling into question mm. the American security guarantee to our friends and allies. So I think it would be bad. A way it will be, I think, worse uh, if Donald Trump's reelected is that in the first term you had a lot of belief by people like Jim Mattis, John Kelly, that, uh, that you know, the responsibilities of the presidency would discipline the president's behavior. And I think we saw that that wasn't true. Um, the good news is that, that the institutional guardrails in American uh, government, it's important to remember the American government was created by people who dislike and distrust government. And that turned out to be really consequential in a Trump first term. And I think will be really consequential in a second Trump term. Um, it matters that Congress exercise its constitutional responsibilities. And I think there you may see uh, an even stronger um, congressional action. Remember in Donald Trump's uh, presidency, the Congress denied the president money to withdraw troops from Europe, Japan, or South Korea. I think you'll see a lot more of that. But if Donald Trump were to be elected, it'll be a chaotic four years with a lot of wild uncertainty. And let me just give you one fingerprint of it. 
Um, the person that President Trump appointed as the acting defense secretary for the last couple of months of his term, a guy named Chris Miller, um, uh, wrote uh, a, a chapter in a think tank's um, policy agenda for Trump advocating a 40 to 50% cut in US defense spending. Mm -hmm. Um, this is the person Donald Trump has said he would appoint as defense secretary if he's elected. So, I mean, the president doesn't get to set the budget. Congress sets the budget. But it gives you a feel for the kind of turbulence we will see in American policy. Wenn ich noch einmal ganz kurz nachfragen darf, es gibt trotz... If I may briefly ask, despite all the doom and gloom that one may preview, there is a considerable number of European observers thinking there's going to be the adults in the room, which we've had seen during the first presidency, uh, saying that again, uh, reality will fence him in. He can't drop Ukraine. He can't completely withdraw from Europe. What would you answer to this kind of people? I think if Donald Trump is reelected, no, the the people who were the adults in the room last time, those people are not going to agree to serve in a second Trump term. And now that we know what a Trump presidency is like and the policy agenda that goes with it, what I think you are likely to see is Donald Trump trying to appoint people who will advance his agenda, which of course every president deserves cabinet secretaries and political appointees who will carry out the agenda that he got elected on. But those people are unlikely to be confirmable by the Senate. Mm -hmm. And so you will see a lot of people in acting roles, which will make policy, again, chaotic. And um, there are a lot of things acting members of the cabinet can't actually do. They can't sign contracts. They can't. Mm -hmm. So a lot of things will get gummed up. Vielen Dank. Ich würde das mal okay, danke. And I'd like to give this over to the other side of this panel. Tony, to you. Europe has uh, been experiencing and survived this first presidency. And according to my opinion, the great push, the great change in many heads has not occurred. What is the right and wrong conclusions that the European the member states have drawn? And also, if you look into the institution, the EU, which you know well, where are the right tracks laid out and which were the wrong tracks laid out? Well, I do think, first of all, the fact that the first presidency of Trump um, did not create such big damage in the oppression of the people lets the people to look at the second presidency in a much too relaxed way. And it's not being anticipated that the world over the past years has radically changed, uh, especially by or latest by the attack of Russia on Ukraine. We are in a much more radically dangerous world than we were in the first presidency of Trump. And we see a war uh, radicalizes societies, and we see a strongly radicalized Russia, uh, which is what the war automatically brings along. And I don't want to take any guilt off Putin, but we have to make clear that this is the case. And we see a radicalizing China. But that has to do with the age of the two presidents, Putin only has a certain lifetime to expect. I would speculate that he's sick, but uh, he doesn't have 30 years to go. And uh, so that probability is very low, and the same applies to Xi. And both want to uh, change things significantly in their lifetime. Xi wants to have the forced reunification unification with Taiwan. In his time as president, Putin wants to have make significantly clear that he has resurrected the uh, Russian Empire. And what we shouldn't forget, and we like to do that, that we have the three reasons. First, or two reasons, 
reasons why Putin has attacked the Ukraine. First is the resurrection of the Russian Empire, and the second is because he doesn't want to have a democracy next to him because he is afraid of his own population as all autocrats. And I think this is the third point we miss. Uh, so countries like Iran, China, and Russia, um, this is the sketch out and the um, a rip. Uh, the rip out of the um, of the existing order, and to do that, it's important for Russia to uh, attack a smaller EU country, and to see that uh, NATO and EU, EU react uh, a bit headlessly, and only a few country as countries support the attack country, and this makes it all so difficult and dangerous. And if I look at what we prepared, we can see that the European Union, with its very limited resources, we have to know that the proper resources, the budgetary means, um, <clears throat> what the EU has, is completely marginalized. The EU works with setting the rules. And of course, they have tried to do things. They have uh, created sanctions, which are not enough. They try to support Ukraine and try to um, change the peace facility so that we can buy, buy weapons with it. One tries to pressure NATO into a stronger standardization in the production of military goods which is important one has got the DSA, the Digital Service Act. Uh, the CHIPS Act has been um, released, which is not an economic question. It's a military question or a safety question, because if I um, can't have a trade chip going through the uh, Strait of Taiwan, we will have a problem with our semiconductors in no time. Uh, so we've got the Raw Materials Act. We're still at the series of individual semi-metals, which are we are 100% dependent of delivery from China. And that means now we have to go further in other areas. The differences are very different. Big, which is in the main capitals, the Nordic states, the Baltic states, Poland, partly in Czechia, Romania, Bulgaria, not so much. Denmark, we see strong consequences that have been drawn. There is an awareness of a problem. Here, this is very, very volatile. If I look towards the chancellery or Mr. Mertz, uh, who, in his naive approach, thinks that we can solve the problems that we are facing if we don't increase the citizens' money and <clears throat> we keep the uh, uh, the debts down and all the other stuff that they prepare. Well, that'll give us ten billion per year. That is ridiculous. With the respect <coughs> to the necessary costs that we are looking at, I think we have. Uh, we have people who work there. They tell me we have three hours of artillery ammunition. Three hours? It's not so much, is it, uh, of 155 rounds? So this is, and if you look down to the south and west, uh, uh, you, if you look at the support of France for Ukraine, well, in absolute figures in GDP, Italy, Spain, wow. Uh, uh, okay, thank, thank you. Uh. Well, this is also a good takeaway from the discussion, but I just briefly want to um, say that you open up the view towards the differences in the EU member states and the homework that everyone uh, and every country has to do, but I would still like to get back to the institutions of the EU, and I think that it's very important what you said there. Well. Uh, there are many things have been changed, different aspects. You also mentioned the sanctions, but also other things like the Digital Services Act, DSA, raw material dependencies, all questions that um, group like a cluster around the security of Europe. But we also have to say that at its core of what is creating security, the EU only has very limited resources. And also when it comes to question of governance, we need unanimity. There's the principle of unanimity in many areas. So a short question for your prognosis, for your forecast. Next year's presidency, 2024, do we still 
have the principle of unanimity in the common European security and defense policy? Well, I hope we don't. And I honestly believe that we do not have it at the moment either, because I've been criticizing Mr. Scholz several times already, but to send Mr. Orban to get a coffee, to fetch a coffee uh, during a decision, it's, it's just the right thing to do. And even today, there's good news. Orban uh, agree. I mean, we do not yet know whether he was bought or put under pressure, um, but he uh, agreed now. So we have to be clear. We have to act with a completely different type of strength. And just to be nice is not sufficient. And to be clear, I personally hold the view that if you, I mean, if Mr. Orban does not agree, for example, the other 26 should just say, well, we heard you said yes, we heard you agreed. So he should actually prove that he didn't. So um, in dealing with these kind of challenges, we need completely a completely different type of strength and different type of actions. This is what we have to learn. We need to act more strongly. Thank you very much. Natalie. I can well imagine that uh, regarding the question of Hungary, you would like to uh, say something on it because you worked on it. So is it sufficient to just send people to fetch a coffee? Or how do we deal with these different forces and diverging interests in the EU of the 27 of Europe um, is or wants to assert itself in this world? So um, you can answer that. But with regard to Georgia, I wanted to ask you, I mean, Georgia's at the borders of the European Union, but since December 2023, it's an accession candidate uh, of the EU. So I wanted to know from your perspective, from the perspective of a Georgian, uh, whether this prospect of a policy enhancement has been utilized strategically uh, in a sufficient way. Thank you very much. Um, can I start with Trump? <laughs> of course you can. <laughs> um, it's too tempting to let go. Um, I would like to a little bit go back to this discussion because it is all linked uh, to the European security. It's linked, obviously, to the decision making and to the enlargement because somehow these are obviously connected. So if we go back to first Trump, what have we learned or Europe has learned from uh, his first tenure? And I think there are three broad things. One is that European and US, the way administration defines interests, may diverge. And the ways of dealing with them may be different. Iran, JCPO is one example. Climate change is another example. Middle East and so on. Another, uh, what's been clear, is that transatlantic rift is uh, possible. It's highly undesirable, but it is no longer inconceivable. And that signals weakening of what we call institutional West. And finally, you may have a president in the White House who is not as committed to European security as we have thought, so this commitment can no longer be taken for granted. Um, and what was um, our response or European response to this challenge and what will it be if it were to come back? I think we can expect that if there is a second Trump, I think Corey would agree, there will be the same challenges, except that they will be more consequential this time around because Europe is engulfed in the largest war since 1945. Uh, and if he's not elected, which is also very much a possibility, these challenges will remain. Uh, they're not going to just disappear, because once you put something on the map, it's still there. Um, 
So the, our response, I don't know what it should be. I think yours, uh, judging by the first panel, would be European Army, um, which was uh, quite striking for me that you have put it so uh, high up in the agenda of discussions. And it was also striking to, for me to see the, uh, um, the results of the voting, because you had put European Army very high uh, uh, as your priority, and also disarmament and uh, peaceful solution of conflict, so European army with no armaments. Uh, so that makes me think that uh, I would agree with Ulrika that it is really a, a nice idea for peaceful times, uh, but for the difficult times uh, it's not. And we have learned a lot of things in this past two years since Russia's uh, war on Ukraine. Uh, and that is tied up. Now I'm moving to the question of um, European unity. Uh, we have learned that under pressure, uh, Europe can get its act together and stay united. And even though you have Hungarys, and even though you may have more than one Hungarys in the near future, this is a big challenge and you need to learn how to deal with it. I think it is absolutely essential. And if the enlargement is to be taken into account seriously, we 35 or 36 unanimity got to go. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, because a lot of small states are really wedded to this idea, uh, you know, they, it's important to have a stake in the decision making and, and feel the strength. It's not going to be easy, uh, but I think it just, uh, the risks of not doing it are too high and the union will be too inflexible and will not be able to take the decisions in times of crisis. Um, when, by the way, one of the uh, good things, that, or once for a change, NATO, um, Trump had a point when he asked Europeans, and I was in Brussels then, he said, uh, why are you not spending your 2% uh, for, NATO, for the defense, and why are you making yourself so dependent on Russian energy if you think Russia is a threat? Um, and I think there he had a point. And the response uh, at that time really was, you guys proceeded with Nord Stream 2. Uh, and another response was European strategic autonomy. And I think now, uh, and you've discussed that earlier, uh, we have to look at this, the idea of strategic autonomy in different uh, light. Um, because um, with the war in Ukraine, I think both of these responses, uh, well, the Nord Stream 2 is dead, but I think strategic autonomy, the way it was conceived at that time, was also damaged because, um, you know, the reality was that U.S. leadership and uh, coordination was indispensable for having a united Western response to what was going on um, with Russia. Uh, it also showed that while EU is important and uh, member states have a treaty obligation to support each other in, term, in terms of crisis, military uh, threat, etc., NATO is critical. And, uh, you know, just by the mere fact that Sweden and Finland, the first response was to apply to NATO, shows that. Um, NATO is uh, absolutely essential, but when we talk about this strategic autonomy, I think we also have to think how to strengthen European pillar of NATO and think about strategic complementarity and not necessarily separation. Um, US obviously is essential in the NATO, um, but we have also seen that um, and Biden administration remains very committed um, to what is going on in, uh, in Europe, we also have seen, and I think this is uh, um, clear, that uh, US interests and priorities lie elsewhere. It is China and it is in the Pacific, and it's not only Trump related. I think one thing that Obama, Trump, and Biden have in common is precisely that, that China is a priority, it is an emerging threat, and Europe should deal with its own security uh, a little bit better. Uh, so in these two years, we have also learned a lot about Europe and uh, what our strengths are and what our weaknesses are. And one weakness is precisely the growing divisions that you may have uh, actors like Orban who are acting out of their domestic political 
or perhaps not uh, interests. And I know that for Orban, the question of minorities is important. And there are Hungarian minorities in Ukraine. Um, and this has always been important for the party. It's a part of the kind of nationalist uh, outlook of the Fidesz party. But the difference here is that uh, there are Hungarian minorities not only in Ukraine, in many neighboring states of Hungary, including Slovakia, Romania, and Serbia. And in all these cases, Fidesz and Orban himself have been very supportive of EU enlargement in these cases, because that makes sense, right? The idea of uniting Hungarian nation within the framework of the EU. So it's very strange why this is not happening in case of Ukraine. Uh, so which obviously makes us think that there are, maybe there are some other considerations also um, at play. Um, and uh, as we're talking about enlargement, I think uh, it's also unavoidable, and I would like to mention that it's important for Georgia, it's been a huge, uh, there's a huge enthusiasm for it in Ukraine, in Moldova, there is less of an enthusiasm in Western Balkans, because I think they've gone a bit cynical, but with us it's still very high. Um, but for Europe, I think it's also important to realize that this is going to be very difficult round of enlargement, uh, very consequential. Difficult because for several reasons. One, that the international environment is no longer the same. It's not the end of history moment anymore. Enlargement is taking uh, place in the context of heightened, in, in the background, but also as part of heightened geopolitical and ideological com competition. Um, the second reason is that the candidate states are not the same. These are not newly independent states that wish uh, and look for recognition and are ready to do anything uh, and that need help when it comes to transformation, uh, democratization and moving to market economy. These are states that have uh, accumulated experience of living in um, as hybrid regimes in gray zone. and. Uh, uh, this will be this will be difficult new entrants, and given the Hungary experience, I think we have also to think not only about um, uh, unanimity, but also about perhaps reversibility of uh, some of the um, uh, criteria. Um, but uh, in conclusion, I've been talking too much, but in conclusion, I think it's important for the EU to realize that enlargement is a unique instrument that only EU has. Uh, there is no other expanding polity in this world where you have countries lined up and asking to be let in. And this is a huge comparative advantage. And I think the trick for the EU is to learn how to use it to a geopolitical advantage without giving up on its normative political identity. Because if it does, then it's going to be like any other state and it will be very damaging for the EU itself. So I would be advocating for normative geopolitics if I could. Thank you very much. Normative geopolitics. So this is uh, still another takeaway from this round. Um, Natalie, just a follow-up question. So the dim to turn around the dimension, if you look at the enlargement, it is the lever of what comes out of the EU and what the EU can strategically use for itself. But from a Georgian perspective, from the perspective of an accession state, all this has a normative dimension, of course. We're connected through values, we're connected to the European idea, but it also has a security dimension. And I would like to hear from you, what are the scenarios on a scale from status quo today, Georgia as an accession candidate and a possible um, a NATO full-fledged membership one day in the future. So what are the different scenarios of a security guarantee that Georgia expects from Europe, the European member states, from the EU, and can expect from these countries? Um, not really. <laughs> Short mm -hmm. answer is, uh, I think the only real security guarantee that works is uh, NATO. Uh, EU is also very important, as I mentioned, uh, but for Georgia, Ukraine, uh, all the candidate countries, the added value of the EU is transformation and building of institutional democracy for Ukraine, its recovery and reconstruction. Mm -hmm. uh, being a member of the EU does give you a certain protection, 
but solid uh, security guarantee is um, is only NATO membership. And the previous panel was discussing deterrence. Uh, we see that deterrence does not work outside NATO. All the countries, the, why is the EU today surrounded by the arc of fire instead of being surrounded by the, um, the peace and prosperity, right? Because it hasn't worked. And uh, the problem also is that, and here the EU is perhaps at fault, uh, deterrence is not only military. Deterrence also has political dimension. And a big part of political dimension is signaling. And up until now, the kind of signaling from the West has not been conducive to deterrence. It has actually been the opposite, such as encouraging. 2008 decision of Bucharest to promise Georgia and Ukraine NATO membership at some point in the, an identified point in the future was not a very good decision, right? It was something that encouraged Putin, but didn't give us any protection. May I ask a question, Natalie? Um, Given that there was nowhere near consensus among NATO countries for their admission, are you advocating that we should have said nothing in 2008? Yes, I think nothing would have been better. And um, because um, this, is, this gives the promise a maybe, but that maybe is an existential question for countries like Georgia and Ukraine. So we build our national security calculations on maybe. And then there is Putin, and then there is Russia, which is very aggressive, and it looks at it and says, they're not serious. So I'm going to go and take this opportunity, right? So he attacks Georgia, mm -hmm. business as usual, reset within several months. Um, no discussion of sanctions. Um, he attacks Crimea, little bit of sanctions, little bit of concern, condemnation, then starts um, Eastern Ukraine, Luhansk and Donetsk. And we have to remember this war that we're talking about is going on for 10 years. This is another escalation. It's a moment in, 20, in February, two years ago, that happened, a full-scale aggression. But the war has started a long time ago. And in that period, and again echoing last panel, deterrence big time works for NATO, but in conventional sense, not against hybrid threats, because Russia has been involved in hybrid attacks all over Europe and uh, including NATO members, right? So there is really a sense today, whether it's Georgia or Ukraine, that outside of this island of security, uh, there is no security. And we have to think what we're doing about this. And this is coming very close to Europe now, because if before, if in case of Georgia, you could have said, OK, maybe it's one off, it's far away, et cetera, today, you it, you cannot ignore the fact that European security is intertwined with Ukraine's and what is going to happen to Ukraine. And as you said, it's further than that. It depends what kind of world we're going to live in, what will happen to the international order. Is it the start of the post-Western world? It's all connected to the response we're going to have. Um, and I hope it will be a bit more decisive in relation to Ukraine. Vielen Dank. Thank you. We will have opportunity to talk about Ukraine in a minute. At length, we've got the NATO, the EU in discussion, and I'd like to uh, ask another question to the audience, asking who should take care of European safety if the U.S. drop out? <clears throat> and what's the EU or NATO as the... Uh, desired safety provider. So EU is the uh, green card and uh, NATO is the orange card. <clears throat> I see a lot of green over here, mixed here. So it's quite a balanced picture. Thank you. So I want to pick this up for the panel and ask Corey, um, asking you on the NATO. We've seen that uh, opinion on the panel. It appeared that NATO, for the time being, will be the safety security institution. Is it set up right? 
Does it did it take the right lessons from the changes the world has seen in the past years? And how would what would the European pillar have to look like? And how would the states have to be around to arrange for meeting these challenges? Uh, so I think NATO doesn't work without American underwriting of NATO, just because there are a number of military functions that only the United States provides. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah, I think NATO's done a fine job, actually, at adapting from 1994. I mean, remember, Germany didn't have a national chain of command um, before uh, unification in the way it does now. All of the turmoil about the Franco-German core and European, all that my entire professional life, we have been talking about how to strengthen the European pillar in NATO. And the honest answer is spend more money, have more troops, take more responsibility. It's not institutional arrangements that facilitate this or that, and it's not political declarations. It's money, troops, and responsibility. But I have to say, actually, Europe's doing pretty well. Uh, yes, you should spend more. Uh, yes, you shouldn't rely so much on the United States. But, but in fact, when things get scary, I think it's illustrative and a beautiful thing that when Russia invaded Ukraine in 2022, all of us were scared and wanted each other nearby. And I think that's actually a really wonderful thing and a demonstration that we can solve problems when we need to solve problems. So I don't think the institutional arrangements matter that much. I think institutionally the most important change in NATO probably came in 1991 when the SACUR, Jack Galvin, uh, you know, at that time, it sounds so quaint now, we were having a big debate about whether NATO could operate outside of the territory of the NATO countries, right? The out of area debate. Uh, and um, political leaders in NATO, my own country included, were hesitant about making that political judgment. And what Jack Galvin did was say, NATO militaries need to have the ability to operate anywhere the political leadership determines they should. And if we can move NATO troops to be able to defend our territory from northern Norway to southern Turkey, mm -hmm. we can do anything else that gets asked of us. And we don't need to take the political step of saying, you know, we're going to operate out of area to have the ability to do it if we need it. And I think one of the things we should be learning, to Tony's very good point about three hours of artillery shells, is what all of us, my own country included, are learning in the war in Ukraine, is that we have economized on weaponry and ammunition in a way that leaves our own countries at risk. The risk isn't that we shouldn't give weaponry to Ukraine because we might need it. The risk is we don't have enough no matter what we do about Ukraine. And we got to solve that problem before somebody tests whether we're willing to defend our own countries. Vielleicht gebe ich das direkt mal rüber zu dir, Toni. Uh, spending troops responsibility, das waren die Sachen, die Cory nannte, was auch die Europäer... Weiter, these are the things what the Europeans do. And um, it's been on paper for years. We know the threat is so close. Why don't we take the bigger leap towards it as Europeans? Well, first, we have to be honest and acknowledge that the Greens are not really the ones who, who um, made the most smart contributions. So I, as a person, that includes me. So that has only turned out at broad range on the 24th of February, 2022. We all couldn't imagine that this kind of war, as we're seeing it now, 
Well, some could think of it, the Polish, the Baltics, so we can't say all of us here, I mean all of us here in Germany. There were some Gustav Kessel um, wanders, but the main, the big majority couldn't. I know the debates that we've had, we really need still Leo Part II. Don't we just need a few uh, helicopters for something like a Mali approach, uh, uh, operation, which we didn't have either, but so here we were smart enough to see this and uh, one didn't want to think uh, and didn't believe the Polish, the Baldus, uh, telling you have a trauma with the Soviet Union. Don't worry, um, we are, have our hands on this. We buy all the gas from there, give them so many, they will never risk it. It's a uh, um, mutual dependency, all the uh, wealth in Putin's uh, empire depends on our money, uh, so relax. And uh, that's what we thought in 2014 as well. So what was the reaction of Germany to that? Uh, a few uh, ridiculous sanctions, Nord Stream 2, and the sale of the big uh, uh, gas storages to, um, to Gazprom. So uh, we were against it as Greens, but uh, for energy politic reasons, not for geostrategic regions, that was the reaction of the federal government. So looking back, we could think, well, we had lost our senses at the time. However, uh, now, if I look at Europe nowadays, for example, here in Germany, there's lots of people and lots of people who are in responsible situations, not only in the Greens, this war seems to be far away. And if we go to France, Spain, Italy, Portugal, Ireland, yeah, there are some refugees. But somehow it's far, far away, and the Europeans are doing their job well. So, of course, we should support them, and the politicians, yes, it's a bit present. But really? A sense of urgency? A feeling for the necessity is something that I perceive with the Polish, the Baltic states, a bit in Czechia, Slovakia, not so much, a bit Romania, Bulgaria, Finland, Sweden, Norway, and that's it. And if we don't have this impression that it needs, so why should that beautiful money be spent on horrible things like tanks and artillery ammunition if we could spend it on nice things like kindergarten, schools, universities, and elsewise? These nice and necessary things that do make sense. And. I think this is a lack which we clearly see, and uh, this is where the lack is in Germany as well. And sometimes I'm concerned that uh, despite of the Zeit and Wende, which has been declared and never really was implemented, the European societies, beyond the ones that I've just listed, Baltic, Polish, and so on, will only wake up to Russia attacking the next country. And this is a task to make this clear to the people. It is really important and really urgent. And from the chancellery, I hear, well, we survived the first four years of Trump quite well. We'll do the second ones as well. So what's the, what's the fuss? And if I hear to that, I think, my God. Well, maybe we will be able to kind of push that sense of urgency here in the room. Natalie, I'd like to turn to you. You watch the Ukraine development quite closely. What's the scenario for the further development of the war that is at discussion? And what do we have to prepare for if actually the next president in the States is Donald Trump? Um, well, there are... Uh only several options, right, if we look at scenarios where, or trajectories where this can go. Um, one is Russia wins, and it's a disaster all around, and I agree. I think it is important, it's a responsibility of politicians to explain to people what that means, uh, both uh, uh, for Europe, for each country, and globally. Uh, there is a case when Ukraine wins, but that depends on Western support. Um, then there is an option of a deal, uh, which can be a bad deal, and it can 
equal a defeat. So we'll have to see uh, that. And the, if there is any deal, it should definitely have some sort of legitimacy. So, and again, think of the consequences this will have more broadly. For example, if, and I know there's talk about it, we push Ukraine for some territorial concessions and then move on with something else, okay, if the two agree, but what does that mean for the international order? What does it mean for the principles that have we all uh, signed up to and had a stabilizing impact, right? So you, you for, give up your territory because a big neighbor fancies some of your land. That's like the foundation of it, which is not very good foundation for ordering the world in the future. And then there is a, a most likely, and in principle this is where we are now, and that's a protracted conflict. Um, we are in it now because, you know, uh, the war goes on for a very long time now, um, and we're in a situation where neither sides have capabilities to inflict military breakthrough, uh, but also uh, neither side is ready to uh, start negotiations and think of concessions. So we're in that equilibrium, and uh, it looks likely to go on. Uh, there are several factors that create this equilibrium and Western hesitancy is a big part of it. Um, Ukraine's determination to fight, of course, is, uh, is another. But in order to uh, really make the difference, the Western aid so far, it seems to me, has been giving enough to Ukraine to carry on, to withstand, but not to push towards victory. And I think we really need to give Ukrainian victory a chance. There are ethical considerations here as well, and I think this is something that is important for the Greens. You know, giving a half-hearted support uh, is like, you know, sometimes no is better than maybe. It costs a lot of lives, it costs a huge destruction, and uh, and if it's going to be withdrawn already later, you know, and sometimes you think it probably would have been better to do it before. Uh, what does it say also about our uh, commitments to peace and, um, and justice? Um, there is also another factor I think that is important in terms of global uh, implications is that this kind of protracted war um, first of all, it creates complacency and war becomes new normal. I think that's been uh, mentioned. So the sense of urgency is gone. And the further you are, maybe there was no sense of urgency in the beginning and now it will be completely gone. So it fades into the background and drops from uh, headlines. Um, but it also creates permissive conditions for the proliferation of conflict around the globe. because. Attention is distracted, it's divided. Uh, there are opportunities, the international norms are violated. Uh, there is almost entirely erosion of any arms, um, non-proliferation treaties um, and uh, confidence building measures. Uh, multilateral institutions are marginalized. So if you wanted to try something, and if you are an opportunist politician, this is a very good moment to do so, right? And we have seen some of it. So as the, and some countries like Russia will be interested in this happening, right? Because first of all, it taxes uh, resources, it gets US distracted. Um, and again, that uh, that also gives time in this protraction to engage in the battle of narratives and win ideological uh, supporters. So um, this is a very uh, dangerous moment. It can go on for a very long time. As I said, it's been going on for 10 years and now it's kind of peaked. But it's also an unstable period because it's only a preparation, it's a transition. So no, later, one or the other side will have the capacity to push. And it is in everybody's interest because this is really high stakes. Uh, for the European security in everyone's interest to see this war end in a way that after this the world and Europe will emerge stronger and more orderly and not the other way around because what we see now is we see Europe's insecurity architecture emerging rather than the security one. Vielen Dank. Also, wir blicken in fast jedem Szenario wahrscheinlich auf jeden Fall. Okay, so thank you. In every scenario, we seem to be looking at a long-term perspective that Ukraine will need support. Corey, I'd like to um, 
come back to you and uh, look at the role of the U.S. as supporter in, of Ukraine. We've seen the narrative shift in Biden that says we support to as long as necessary, as long uh, to as long as we can. And if we look at the current situation in the Congress, uh, the question is how long can uh, they? Uh, maybe you could give us an outlook on First, in the scenario, Donald Trump wins the next elections, but also the scenario, Joe Biden carries on as president in a uh, the political situation that we're in now in the parliament. Uh, what would be the perspective in that respect? Uh, so I think if Donald Trump is elected president, Ukraine loses. I, I don't think a President Trump would attempt to keep Congress's feet to the fire and provide the assistance that Ukraine needs. Um, so, so full stop. Mm -hmm. um, President Biden, I agree with Natalie's criticism of the administra my administration's policy uh, that they're not doing enough to help Ukraine win and that allowing it to drag out is not only uh, carrying a terrible price for Ukraine, but it's also, it leaves space for Russian narratives, it leaves space for domestic politics to come back into all of our support, right? You know what Americans are really upset about? Taylor Swift and Travis Kelsey holding hands after a football game. Um, and that, the lack of focus is a function of the time that we have allowed to elapse. Um, so, so that matters a whole bunch. President, so I should say, I should have said at the start about American politics. So it's gonna be a tumultuous year. Uh, President Biden has a 38% approval rating. No sitting American president has ever been elected with so low a public approval rating. 50% of my fellow Republicans say that they will not vote for Donald Trump if he's our nominee. 11% of Republicans voted for, for Joe Biden in 2020, and that was a big part of the margin of victory. So a whole bunch more republic. The truth is Americans don't like either candidate. Um, and yet that's what the system has produced. There, is the, there are three wild cards coming in the American election. One is the potential of a third party candidate. Second, Nikki Haley is gonna stay in the Republican nominating race to the end because of the second potential wild card, which is that the Supreme Court could strike Donald Trump off the ballot because of the 14th Amendment's um, prohibition of somebody who engages in insurrection from holding public office. And the third potential wild card is that Donald Trump could be in jail by the time um, the election. Right, 91 counts of indictments against him. Uh, so this is gonna be a crazy year, um, uh, but I do think one of the risks for President Biden is that his stalwart, as long as it takes line, um, erased Americans' dissatisfaction with the abandonment of Afghanistan, and in particular, the way Afghanistan was abandoned by the Biden administration. And abandonment of Ukraine, that's two data points, and President Biden's um, popularity ratings never recovered after Afghanistan. And so I think actually the White House has a crass domestic political reason for not going too far down the as long as we can line of argument. Vielen Dank. Ich glaube, es ist ganz wichtig, auch diese innenpolitische Dimension immer mitzudenken. Thank you very much. It's always very important to also consider the domestic policy dimension <laughs> when you talk about uh, European security. So uh, one, after one or two minutes, I would like to open up the round for the audience. So please think about possible questions that you would like to hear from our panelists. But first, I would like to uh, continue to the debate amongst the panelists with a short uh, what if round. So. I would like to ask all three of you, what 
it would be your first measure as a policy maker that you would take in order to increase European security. Cory, I would like to start with you. If you could, if you would be a policy planner within NATO, what be what would be the one measure that you would recommend in order to increase security and safety in Europe? Spend money on defense policy. Great, thank you very much for this takeaway. Natalie, for you, I would like to ask you and make you the president of the European Commission, what would be your number one measure for the European security? Um, I think one thing that's been recommended a lot by experts, and I would take that seriously, look at the European security and defense landscape. It's very fragmented. So I would move towards harmonization and maybe even uh, looking at, you know, complementarity, taking into account who does what better. All this different kit, we understand there are producers, there are people involved, but there is also responsibility to come to each other's aid. If you can't operate each other's kit, it's going to be very difficult. So I think uh, looking at this fragmented uh, environment would be probably the first one. Thank you very much. And last but not least, Tony, if you were Chancellor in Germany, what would be your number one measure in favor of European security? Well, I would set up a special funding of 300 billion euros, 100 billion for the Federal Armed Forces, or 80 billion for the Federal Armed Forces, 20 billion for cooperation projects with other countries, 100 billion in order to purchase uh, weapons for Ukraine because they are fighting for all of us, and another 100 billion for the enhanced security term of cybersecurity to bridges uh, that are um, that need to be um, refurbished in Germany because many bridges in Germany can no longer bear 100 tons at a time and um, also to make sure that we have um, a grip on rare earth etc um, so I would do these kind of things thank you very much Maybe there are a few reactions from the audience with regard to these measures, but I'm sure that there are also questions. And I can see a few hands going up already. I would like to start here in the front. Milena, can you come here with the microphone? Ms. Schreier. Michaela Schreier, and I would like to come back to the question of the um, necessity to uh, support the other allies. Um, and you said that uh, Putin might attack a Baltic state and assuming that, um, that the others are not helping. Um, and we already heard that there's the obligation to defend the others within the EU treaties. And this is a clause which is quite a strict clause. It means that uh, when a member state is attacked militarily, the others have to stand by this state and support this state. And they owe it to that state. And it does not say the council first has to decide upon that. Uh, but when a state says, I have been attacked, please help me, then the other states have to uh, fulfill their obligation to stand by and to help, and not just by sending a few helmets, for example, but this clause says with all available means. And um, so I think this uh, standby clause is not really um, what people are thinking of uh, at the moment. And uh, the question to Anton, is the German Bundestag, the German parliament, really aware of the fact that in this case, the soldiers that, for example, are uh, stationed in the Baltic states have to become active, for example, and the German parliament could no longer veto it, but it's a direct primary European law. Thank you very much. This was also um, 
very interesting with a question mark at the end. Walter Kaufmann from the Böll Foundation. I have a question to Natalie Sabanatze. You talked about the normative geopolitics. Can you elaborate on that? with a view to Georgia. So Georgia is a country in a very fragile security situation and at the same time with a very strong democratic backsliding that we can see at the moment. And the candidate status was quite an ambivalent decision to give it to Georgia. So how are we going to proceed when we see severe crisis in the course of the year, which is not very unlikely? So where are the red lines? Um, Thank you very much. In the back, the gentleman with the glasses. Well, it was uh, asked to give more money and spend more money on defense. Could you say your name first? My name is Mattis, but I'm a private citizen here, not in my official capacity. So more um, defense spending. I do share this view, but how do you... Uh, assess the efficiency so far. When we look at the statistics of the International Institute for Strategic Studies, or CIPRI in Stockholm, since uh, up until 2021, as Germany, we have spent uh, as much as Russia, France, as well as, as much as we do, UK as well, but the Americans have done or spent 10 times as much. Sometimes it doesn't make sense, but uh, the question is, have the funds being spent wisely from your point of view? A question to uh, Tony Hofreiter and Cory Scharke. Or do we have a problem here as well? Thank you very much. Over there, there was a question. However, the hand was taken down again. So then lady here in the front, and then we will go back to the panel. Well, I've got two questions, Mr. Hofreiter. Uh, how or me, does it make sense to uh, scold the other Western European states that they would not take enough care of um, Ukraine. I mean, there are other statements in the press and the media that would contradict you. And does it really make sense in the current situation to do it? Um, this is one question. And the other question is how do we deal with these large weapon sales to Ukraine or the passing on of weapons to Ukraine who is not uh, treating these uh, weapon deliveries in the right way. So how can we make sure that uh, these weapons do not appear on the black markets and we suddenly ask ourselves, oh, how did this happen? So uh, regarding corruption, how far are we in, with regard to Ukraine? Thank you very much for the quick questions. We will answer the question now. Tony, uh, is the Bundestag aware that there is the necessity to stand by have has the defense spending been wisely? Why do we scold the uh, other European countries? And how? Uh, how about? And sorry, I couldn't hear this without the microphone from the audience. Um, I'm not quite sure whether the uh, Bundestag is aware of it that there is a clear a necessity to um, provide support within Europe. But I was talking of a smaller NATO country. But um, it's exactly what I said. I mean, we are signaling towards Putin that we are indecisive, undecided, and we signal our weakness. And my concern is that it makes him try out things. I think that we would eventually assert ourselves. I mean, he was highly surprised, really surprised how um, the Europeans came together in the reaction on his war of aggression. But it was the signaling. Um, what we send out as signals as Europeans and also as Germany towards Putin is the following. If you stay on it as long as possible, you will be able to win the war. And if you are, um, well, aggressive enough, then the West will not speak with one voice. And I'm not sure whether we can still prevent these things. Um, but on the other hand, I would say Putin could not be able to self-assert. But um, if there is uh, an attack, of course, many people die. So at the moment, we do signal the absolute wrong thing to Putin, which is 
that it's worthwhile to continue the war for him, for his regime, that it's worthwhile for his regime to attack further countries. And we should actually signal quite the opposite. And this is why this hesitancy that I consider as lack of leadership when it comes to Scholz and the tanks is so difficult. And also regarding the Tauros, it's so problematic. This um, undecidedness is, is highly problematic. So <clears throat> the Ukrainians are not allowed to attack a military facility on an originally Russian territory with Western weapons, but this is counterproductive because it always stands for weakness, for being intimidated, for hesitancy. And this is actually uh, uh, falsely interpreting the psychogram of Putin. People always think that they should not provoke him, and this is what he tells people by way of his proxies through Wagenknecht and the AFD, the right-wing party in Germany, so that if we would provoke him, then he would enhance the war. But he's provoking us all the time. And um, history has shown us as soon as the West shows strength and decidedness, he is going to stop because he's not a suicide, uh, suicidal terrorist or whatever um, in his framework. He's a dictator who's acting rationally, who is using and making use of the gaps um, in an opportunistic way that we leave for him, and we leave way too many gaps. And regarding the efficient defense spending, uh, spending no, no, it's not been efficient. I mean, the Americans are not spending their funds uh, efficient either. So, of course, we have to be clear about one thing. So usually funding for armies is never spent in an efficient way. We have to be clear of that. I mean, this is not meant to be an excuse for how we do it in some part. And Juncker brought up the example and said, well, the Americans have one uh, tank, fighting tank type, and the Europeans have 17 fighter tank types, and this is inefficient. I mean, I do not want to say anything against um, the Americans. They have different ones, but um, the Abrahams compared to the Leopard is not really very good. So maybe Europe should have two to three types in order to have one type which is very good, very efficient, but to have diff 17 different types means that it's really inefficient. But of course it's understandable. I mean, According to which criteria do we normally do military tenders or award um, uh, um, contracts? Usually, the criterion is, I mean, eventually, in which electoral district is the company located that produces the weaponry and is there Strukturelle Probleme. Is, are there structural problems in that electoral district? And this is how we spread the barracks, uh, usually in the economically weaker regions, um, and whether the equipment is really good, whether the Federal Armed Forces really need the equipment, then this is only a secondary question. And um, in an not very ideal scenario, it is no question at all. And of course, we cannot afford it in these times. Uh, but to shift, to, to achieve a shift, to, to get away from that isn't very easy either. So this is why I said from the 100 billion, I would <coughs> spend 80 billion right away on the Federal Armed Forces, but 20 billion should be given to the EU Commission in order to spend it as a funding for better cooperation. So if two, three, four countries want to uh, procure something together, then they should get additional funding for it. And similar to basically everyone who tries to save taxes, governments are very eager to get European funding and um, yeah, get a share of this European funding for themselves. And this is a very efficient carrot, so to speak, to make people doing something uh, sensible. And this is why the European Union needs its own funding. 
And um, this is why it does not make sense to uh, keep the European budget at a lower level and to spend large part, or for example, for the uh, area uh, funding in the agricultural sector for set-aside areas in the agricultural sector. Um, I mean, this has also something to do with the fact that the heads of state and government should say we have a war in Europe. And if we do not act based on solidarity, this war will be uh, enhanced. And we have to bring this home to the people. We have to stick together. But um, this is actually what I would like to see. Um, and now coming back to the question. We simply have a problem that um, relevant countries spend less when it comes to their gross domestic product than even Germany, and Germany is not spending enough in terms of military support for Ukraine, even though from a nominal point of view we are the second largest donor compared to the gross domestic product. But we also have to make one thing clear. I mean, we can be very grateful to the Americans with regard to what they did, but we already have a problem with Jack Sullivan and the Biden administration. So why do the Ukrainians not get good ammunition for the HIMARS? I do not understand it. I, mean, I do not understand why we do not deliver the Taurus, but I neither understand why the Americans cannot supply good ammunition for the HIMARS, or why, when it comes to the 6,000 Abrams fighter tanks that the Americans have on stock, why was it such a drama to send 31, just 31 of 6,000? So we already have a huge problem now with the American administration. I mean, one could have also sent 500 to Ukraine. This would have had an effect. I mean, we supplied 18 of our 300. I mean, it's not really convincing either. And for these 18, we ordered 18 new ones from the producer and not 100 or more um, of the beautiful Howitzer 2000, we supplied 14 to a thousand kilometer front line. This is, I mean, better than nothing, but what are you going to do with 14, just 14 Howitzers, tank Howitzers for 1,000 kilometers um, of front line? And some of them even lie idle because they cannot shoot uh, as many times as they need to, because um, at the front line, you need to um, shoot more and more shells than in other um, settings. And I mean, if you supply 14, you cannot wait for three quarters of a year up until you've decided whether you have to order um, wheels or uh, chains to replenish your stock. Um, sorry for that um, emotional statement. And yes, it is a problem in Ukraine, but um, and regarding a howitzer, um, I mean, a howitzer will not appear on the black market. It would actually be too big. Um, I wouldn't be concerned about that. And um, this is, um, and, and the alternative would be even more problematic. The alternative would be that Ukraine is losing the war with all horrible consequences for the people in Ukraine. And um, eventually, we would have to act ourselves. I mean, Ukraine does not want much from us. They do not demand much. They just want weapons and money. They are the ones who are dying and at a large extent in order to defend all our freedom, also the freedom of people who are sitting here so that we can freely discuss and debate. This is what Ukrainian soldiers are dying for. And this is something that we have to keep in mind. They do not demand much from us. Thank you. That was a very important statement. Despite from uh, Ukraine to uh, Georgia, there was a question to you. Uh, yeah, I would like 
like to just add, in terms of um, shortages on the front, uh, I was listening the other day that artillery shells, some really, we're talking about basic supplies, they're making a lot of difference with simple drones, but the ratio of artillery shells now, the difference it is one to five. So they have five times, oh, you know 10? <laughs> okay. Yeah, so uh, it's really, um, really dramatic. So, and, and when it comes to uh, production, what I've heard, the orders are in, but we can only expect uh, enough production and delivery in 25. So talking about protraction, I think this is a recipe for it. Um, to normative geopolitics and Georgia, it is often posited that interests and values are uh, opposites, and you have to make choice. Uh, in particularly in foreign policy. I think European Union is a very good example that this is not necessarily the case because uh, it is uh, in, well, first of all, uh, normative side of it is part of Europe's political identity, right? And it is in its interest to uh, promote that uh, because this is how you get a, a stable, like-minded countries around you. It is in the geopolitical interests of the EU. So I have often said that that decision to invite um, Ukraine to offer candidate status to Georgia and start accession talks with Ukraine and Moldova was probably the most geopolitical decision that the EU took. So it was the right one. Uh, however, it is also very important that the balancing when it comes to criteria, respect for criteria and respect for norms is also done very carefully. And Georgia is a good testing uh, case for this. Um, I, I, the way it was communicated, the decision on the candidate status, A, geopolitical uh, needs um, and interests of the EU, but two, also kind of a, a reflection of the popular support, right? Georgia is extremely pro-European country, and it was said very clearly by um, uh, commission president that now it is the turn of the government to start to de deliver on uh, reforms. And for this, I think it's important to think what do we put in the criteria, what the EU puts in the conditions, and whether the enlargement criteria is still relevant because um, and adequate for, for the new circumstances and new candidates. Because it was set up for the post Cold War period for the first, second enlargements when, when the conditions were different and the candidates were different. So we're not talking about, uh, you know, promoting established democratic, establishing democratic regimes and market economies. What we deal with, the main problem now is democratic backsliding. Now it is the kind of uh, you, you know, semi-authoritarian, there are different names of it, competitive authoritarian regimes, types uh, that you have now increasingly in Georgia, in Serbia, and in many other countries. And the biggest problem for the EU's normative power is Hungary, because internal member state is doing exactly that and is being um, an example for, for others. Uh, another problem is the kind of breakdown of consensus, not, I wouldn't say entirely breakdown, but weakening of consensus around the values. Uh, you have a, a, a serious um, uh, competition coming from Russia and many others with this conservative populism. Uh, the rise of this talk on traditional values, um, disregard to some of the uh, rights, uh, rights of minorities, etc., and uh, re regaining these values and defending them and, and showing that this is part of what Europe stands for, I think is again very important and it wasn't like that uh, before. And another is non-alignment with also some of the foreign political uh, priorities. So making this work in a geopolitical way is that we have, we have um, same interests uh, Georgia is very much interested, or other candidate states, uh, interested in accession. So uh, the conditionality should be very well targeted, and then it will work. But I think conditionality may need to be revised. So two quick points, one on efficiency and one on uh, sales of weapons on the black market. First, I absolutely agree with Tony. I don't know a defense department that spends money efficiently. Um, and certainly there is an enormous amount of inefficiency in the $848 billion a year that the United States spends. 
um, and for all the reasons Tony outlined. Um, but I don't think the American Department of Agriculture is particularly efficient either. And um, I'm not sure efficiency is what we should judge our military on. Effectiveness is what we should judge them on. And what I think is true of, of all of the NATO militaries, certainly the German and American military, and you can actually also see it emerging in the Ukrainian military, which is that we predominantly invest in our people, right? that healthcare, training, education, those things are an increasingly large proportion of our defense spending. And what that gets you is good problem solvers because warfare is about competitive adaptation. Um, and, and Western militaries are really good at figuring out how to solve problems. You can see that actually in the difference between what the Russian military is good at and what the Ukrainian military is good at. Ukraine's good at problem solving. They struggle to, um, to uh, consistently spread good ideas across their force. The Russians are incredibly slow to solve problems. But what they're good at is standardization across their force once they see a problem. So um, uh, it's a good thing that we invest in smart people and in, in uh, volunteer forces like ours. The professionalism really, really matters for the conduct of the military. Um, so I'm not that worried about bad spending in our own forces. Uh, on, on uh, Ukrainian, your concern, your legitimate concern about aid given to Ukraine ending up on the black market. The first thing I would point out, my team actually did the analysis on this. 85% of US aid to Ukraine gets spent in the United States of America. Right? It gets spent making the weapons that we are giving to Ukraine. Um, so it's Ameri the money gets spent in the United States. But you are right to worry about corruption in Ukraine. It's an enormous problem in Ukraine. They're making good progress against it. We have watched very carefully uh, for the bleeding out of weapons. And what we see is actually uh, the standard kind of corruption you see in war economies which is overcharging for contracts for things like army jackets. Mm -hmm. We have actually not seen the sale of weapons on the black market. Danke. Wir sind fast am Ende. Ich würde fünf Minuten... Uh okay, we're nearly through. I'd give you five minutes off the coffee break. And I've seen a question over here and over here. I'd like to take these two, one more over there. And a very brief answer. And the questions in brief as well, please. One over here. Can we have a microphone? Yes. Well, I hear Tony has to go to an uh, election to vote. A person I'd vote, would it be okay if Tony goes over? I'm sorry, we have a federal session in parliament. I have to go to vote. Sorry. Okay, Tony. I can only say thank you for the invitation and interesting debate. Thank you for the good contributions. And uh, we will keep it up and uh, try to convince the chancellor to do more. Uh, because the consequences, if we carry on, we are, are too bad, and this is why we have to stop them. So all the best, and I'm off. Okay, a very brief round. The gentleman in the black shirt, hello, Adrian. Uh, scholar of the Bell Stiftung, a quick question to Ms. Shaki. In the beginning, you 
it was mentioned that you are explicitly conservative in your security policy. So how do you are in conflict content-wise with our green understanding of security policy and who in the common uh, in the coming elections are you going to vote for? Hello. Office of the Heinrich Böll Foundation. First, very briefly, some shameless self-promotion. We have a study coming out on how European transatlanticists should deal with a Trump 2.0 administration. With, we're doing with CSIS coming out later today. The point that I wanted to raise is I thought I noticed a little bit of a disconnect between what Tony was saying and what you were saying, Natalie. Uh, when we were talking about normative geopolitics and how do we maintain the rules-based order and how do we promote the rule of law, and Tony was saying also sometimes with some autocrats you have to be tough. They only understand the language of power. And so to what extent do we need to bend rules or in some cases break rules in order to maintain the, the rules-based order? world order. Russian assets, the discussion that we're having right now, how to use the frozen Russia's assets is one of those, for example. Thank you. One more question for Corey. A personal matter and the second to Natalie, and then we'll have a coffee break. Corey, please go ahead. Uh, so I didn't hear anything from any of our colleagues from the Green Party that I wouldn't have signed up to happily and enthusiastically. So it's actually quite interesting how strong the convergence is. And I think what has created the convergence is the behavior of Russia, China, Iran, North Korea, the emerging autocratic axis that's making us all scared. And so it's a beautiful thing that, that, the, that as a conservative Republican, I can endorse everything that I heard from my Green Party colleagues. That tells me, actually, that we are all uniting to protect our societies and to advance our values. That's a good thing. As for who I vote for, I sure hope I'm not just going to have a choice of Joe Biden or Donald Trump, because I am serenely unrepentant of having signed all of the anti-Trump letters in 2016, and I uh, wouldn't vote for, if Donald Trump is the candidate of my party, I can't vote for him because I think he's a danger to the Constitution. So I will have to vote for Joe Biden, but I hope I get a better choice. Okay, thank you, and thank you for that uh, honest answer as well, Natalie. That's a good answer uh, and, and a good question as well. Um, I think there is no point of promoting norms if you're not willing to defend them when they're challenged. Then it just becomes hypocrisy. Uh, so Russia is doing just that. It's challenging rules-based order with force and it wants multipolar disorder. This is how I would call it. So unless we put up resistance to this, it means that we're okay with what it wants. And I think that there, I think, um, there is a complete uh, overlap. Um, what else did you ask me? That was it. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, Vielen Dank. And Thank you very much to you too, to Tony as well, to the discipline in the audience for the four minutes. Uh, it was a pleasure to me, and I wish all of you a good refreshing coffee break. We'll carry on at 4 o'clock on the hour, and I'm looking forward to more discussion with you for the rest of the day. Thank you.